Episode 1 of Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell Adapted for radio by Mike Walker With Joseph Milson as Eric Blair It was the summer of 1936. I was married. I'd just written The Road to Wigan Pier. My ideas were beginning to crystallise as the political situation in Spain began to descend into chaos. I thought that at last I might have a part to play in the struggle of world socialism to create a society where, for once... The working class were in the driving seat. <coughs> there any coffee? Creo que quedan en el cazo, camarada. In the pot. Pot. Uh, pot. Uh, yes, see. Sí. Thanks, comrade. Uh, gracias. <coughs> oh. <laughs> Calentito, oh. a que sí. It's bloody hot. It's good. I needed that. Cigarette, comrade? Oh, gracias, camarada. Uh, thank you. Yeah. They say it's Russian tobacco. A tobacco <coughs> russo. <coughs> oh. Voy a matar a esos malditos gallos y desayunármelos. <laughs> Kill the rooster. <laughs> El gallo. Los dos. Uno, bang, dos. <laughs> bang. Very, very good. I, I shot an elephant once. Ne never shot a rooster. Um, prefer to shoot at fascists. Uh, no puedo comer fachas. You choke on a fascist, but a good chicken, eh? Oh, 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 even a bad one. It is food. And a hungry man never turns away food. Can you see it? Justo en el punto de mira de mi... Putas balas saboteadoras. Another dud. That, that's the trouble. Nothing works here. Hoy han ganado los gallos, pero mañana... Yeah, that's it, comrade. Today the chickens won. Tomorrow we'll kill fast. Um, I was hit, uh, shot by a fascist sniper. It was on the Wesker Front. I was part of the uh, 29th Division of the People's Army. I was a lieutenant. It was the 20th of May, 1937, uh, five o'clock in the morning, near the corner of the parapet. I felt it, it was like um, somehow being at the centre of an explosion. Yes, uh, there, was, there was a bang, incredibly loud, and a flash of light, no, um, <coughs> no, no pain at first, just this vast... Shock, as if I'd shriveled into nothing and everything around me had um, shrunk or, or, or gone away, far away. Now, all of this, these, um, these feelings, they must have taken less than a second because, because then my knees gave way. Mierda! Mierda! Uno ha caído aquí! Ha caído un hombre! Is he hit? Are you hit? <coughs> Where are you hit? Hay sangre. Sangre por aquí. Le han dado de seguro. Comrade, can you hear me? We, we need to open his shirt. Cut his shirt. Can you hear me, Eric? We have to get at the wound. Tienes una navaja? Where's that bloody knife? Toma, usa esta. Necesitamos vendas. Vendas! Necesitamos una camilla! I always said he was too bloody tall. Bloody hell. Bloody fascist bastard. No puede hablar. 
Debe ser la garganta. Debe tenerlo en la garganta. Look, get, get him on here. Get him on the stretcher here. You ready? <coughs> Careful, comrades. Throat wound, Calvary. He's already oh. dead. <coughs> Easy. Come on. Let's get moving. Más vendas. Necesitamos más vendas. It will be all right, Eric. It will be all right. We'll get you to hospital. It will be all right. Yeah. Okay. Together. Lift. <laughs> Where's that bloody van? Bloody anarchists. They never bloody. Just do your job, comrade. Right. Keep your mouth shut. They're going for an ambulance and it's coming. <laughs> Put him down here. No. Easy, easy. <coughs> Come on, go and see where the van is. Quickly. Voy a ver dónde está. God. You're a fag, anyone? Here you are. Oh, Taylor made. Jammy bastard. <coughs> Thanks, Conrad. Call for Barcelona. Eric's missus. They're coming, mate. We'll get you to hospital. We'll be all right. He's coming. He's here. At last. Camarada. Buena suerte. You hang on, Conrad. You'll come through this. Um, the day I got shot, it wasn't quite the last act of the whole tragedy, I suppose, if I'm being honest. And I, I want to be honest, that's what it was. But it was certainly the beginning of the last act. <coughs> As for the start, that, that was the year before, uh, December 1936, when I arrived in Spain. I remember, um, I remember being in the Lenin barracks in Barcelona... Uh, I saw a young volunteer, 25 or 6, reddish hair, tough looking. He had a peaked leather cap uh, pulled down over one, one eye. He was gazing at a map that one of the officers had open on a table. And there, was, there was something about his face, the face of a man who would commit murder and throw away his life for a friend. As we left, he stepped across the room and gripped my hand very hard. Odd, the affection you can feel for a stranger. It was as if his spirit and mine had crossed the gulf of language and uh, tradition, and we met in utter intimacy. I hope he liked me as well as I liked him. See, I, I knew somehow with absolute certainty that I would never see him again. You see, for me, at the beginning, that young man was what it was all about. Now, looking back, that's not really the beginning, of course. No, that was during the summer of 36 in England. We, Eileen and I, were discussing the news. Uh, the news was all of Spain. Uh, the papers, the radio, and, of course, the cinema newsreels. <laughs> Spain's Republican government faces national unrest as it fails to reform a way of life that has changed little since the Middle Ages. A wave of strikes by the anarchist-backed Trades Union Congress brings in a new Popular Front ministry, with anarchist and communist deputies holding the balance of power. On the 18th of July, a young general in exile in the Canary Islands arrives secretly by plane in Madrid. His name? is Francisco Franco. In the streets, state radio plays through loudspeakers. People of Spain stay tuned in. Traitors to the Popular Front government are circulating lies and spreading panic. Do not panic. Stay tuned in. Only state radio will tell you the truth. Keep listening. Do not panic. Que no cunda el panic spreads rapidly. 
Sunday the 19th of July, the radio broadcasts... Españoles. People of Spain, small group of traitorous generals have raised a rebellion against the lawful government. There is nothing to fear. There is everything to fear. Civil war has begun. In Germany, Chancellor Adolf Hitler promises to stay out of the conflict. Meanwhile, the crack German Condor squadron is sent to provide humanitarian aid. In Great Britain, Mr. Baldwin, though sympathetic to the cause of General Franco, counsels caution and advocates a policy of non-intervention by all European nations. Birds, custard powder. I seem to remember we were talking about custard powder. Eric was asking me why we had so much custard powder and I said it was because he had ordered it and hadn't ordered the gobstoppers. It was midsummer 1936. We were recently married. Eric had a garden. We were growing our own vegetables and... To be honest, I wasn't very happy with the cottage where we were living. The oven, the gas oven. I had to clean that thing just to make it work. It was terrible. It was prehistoric. We'd opened a small general store in the village of Wallington to help make ends meet until... Um, until, well, I had a book with Gallant's, uh, The Road to Wigan Pier. We hoped that Gallant's would publish it through the Left Book Club, which would guarantee a sale of 40,000 copies. And then there was war in Spain. Civil war. It was a revolt against the elected Republican government by the fascists, the, the church and the army and the capitalists. They didn't care about democracy. Yes, it, it was right-wing revolt. Now, I think you, you had to know how people felt then. People on the left, this, the, the terrific feeling that had arisen, the, the hatred and fear of fascism. Tom Galloway. <clears throat> I was a miner, a trades union member. And like a lot of the brothers, I was concerned about events in Spain. There were thousands of us, ordinary people, working class, men and women, who wanted to fight, to take part in this struggle, despite the British government's lack of support for the Republican government, the legally elected Republican government. For most of these volunteers, it was the Communist Party of Great Britain that provided the means, that became the natural uh, conduit for the journey to Spain. I went to the headquarters of the Communist Party at King Street to see the General Secretary, Harry Pollitt. Please sit down, Mr Blair. Thank you for seeing me, Mr Pollitt. Uh, should, should I call you comrade? Are you a member of the party? Uh, no, but you knew that. Then there you are. How may I help you? Well, <coughs> I, I wish to go to Spain and record the struggle of the Republican government and the people against the Nationalist Rebellion. Now, I've been told it will be difficult, if not impossible, to cross the border into Republican-held territory without accreditation from a, a trusted organisation. And the British Communist Party is, in the eyes of the Spanish government, such an organisation. That is true. And as I'm sure you are aware, Mr Blair, many party members are already in Spain, part of the United Front struggle against fascism. However, that does not quite explain to me the nature of your request, since you are not, as we have established, a member of the party. I am a socialist. You cannot doubt that, Mr Pollitt. However, I must ask myself, what kind of socialist are you, Mr Blair? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm not certain the question has any relevance at this at this time. The general line is always and everywhere highly relevant. Quod ubique, quod semper, quod ab omnibus est. Look, 
surely the uh, surely the point is, Mr. Pollitt, we all share a desire, a passion, to fight fascism wherever it appears in the world. And yet, Mr. Blair, it is important to know that you can depend upon your comrades in the fight. In a struggle of this nature, party discipline is vital, and that depends on political reliability, and I cannot find it in myself, Mr Blair, to believe that you are politically reliable. I hope I am not. But that makes no difference to my support for the Republican government. I wonder if, in the end, it is even wise that you should go to Spain. <coughs> it is dangerous. The anarchists, our supposed allies, are daily committing the most appalling atrocities. If you find yourself in anarchist ranks, how long do you think you'll survive? If I was you, I would think hard about this whole plan of yours. Perhaps your pen would be better employed at home. I am determined to go, with or without the help of the British Communist Party. You're a stubborn man, and I admire that. Here's what I can do. If you guarantee to join the International Brigades and accept party discipline, we will issue you documents of accreditation. In principle, I would have no objection to joining the International Brigades. I intend to do so, but I cannot guarantee in advance to do so. I must see with my own eyes what the conditions are, what is happening out there, and only then, only when I know what is going on, do you see? I see, Mr Blair, that we have no more to discuss today. Thank you for your time, Mr Pollitt. We met afterwards at the pub. It wasn't good news. Obviously, Harry Pollitt didn't consider him politically reliable. Not that Eric was exactly annoyed by this. In a way, I think he sort of expected it. And anyway, it was quite true. Eric had never been, never was politically reliable. Not if it meant sticking to a position, however much the evidence of his own eyes might point to a different conclusion. He never felt bound to a party line. In fact, I've always felt that whenever he saw a line, he felt on a bound to cross it. Harry Pollitt was a classic apparatchik, a survivor, a very tough customer. A man who could execute a 180-degree turn whilst maintaining that he is heading straight ahead at all times. He knew exactly what he wanted. Or perhaps what the common turn and Stalin wanted. It's important to remember that. The common turn was financing most European communist parties straight out of Moscow and their party policies were likewise coming straight out of Moscow. We know that now, to our cost, we didn't know then. If we had, I, at least, might not have been so keen to see Eric go to Spain, but then we both felt it was vital in view of the international situation. I thought there would be something distasteful, disgusting, even, in talking about socialism and what was right and decent for men and women in this world if one hadn't put one's own life on the line. It would be like uh, like playing poker with someone else's money. Like the stock exchange, I suppose. And I never wanted to be a stockbroker. I just wanted to get to Spain any way I could. Uh, Fenner Brockway, MP for the ILP... The Independent Labour Party. To be honest, by 1936, the ILP was no longer the force it had once been in British politics. With the war in Spain, we, we saw a chance to exercise greater influence on the left using our links with PUM, the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification. Bit of a mouthful. <laughs> We set about getting British volunteers to the war zone, particularly those who were beginning to make a name and reputation on the left. Hello, ILP offices. How may I help you? I'm trying to contact Mr Fenner Brockway, MP, regarding travelling to Spain. And your name, please? Yes, it's Blair, Eric Blair. Ah, Mr Blair. 
pleasure to meet you, even over the telephone. I am an admirer of your work as George Orwell. I look forward to the publication of your book on poverty in the North. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Brockway, I presume? Yes. You mentioned Spain. What can we do for you, Mr. Blair? Well, I heard that the ILP had an office in Barcelona. That is correct. Yes. Would it be possible to provide me with a letter of introduction to your representative there? John McNair. Yes, a good comrade. A dependable man. We could certainly do that for you. Oh, and, and it would aid my travelling if there were any way in which I could be accredited as a member of the English press. If you would like to contribute articles on the struggle to our magazine, New Leader, you could be issued with a press card. Well, uh, that would be splendid. You are not actually a member of the ILP. No, not, not at this time. Hmm. Well, that can be attended to later. We will write to McNair and send you a press card. Um, if you will be so good as to give me your address... So I had my press pass and my papers. What I did not have was money. The Galants had just confirmed that the Left Book Club would take the road to Wigan Pier. They were offering an advance of £100 for the publication, which was good money. Galants wasn't paying up yet. Partly, I think, uh, because he was concerned about sections of Wigan Pier and was adding a preface to the book stating that my opinions were not his or those of the left book club or, or the left in general, which left me with a problem. He'd been to see the bank manager to try and raise an overdraft. For a holiday in Spain, Mr Blair. Hardly the proper subject for an overdraft request. Eric explained it was a war, not a holiday. Oh... I was in the last show. I should keep out of it if I were you. And the bank certainly can't be doing with such things. I told Eric we just had to sell the family silver. I said, do we have any family silver? Eileen reminded me about my parents' cutlery set. They'd given it to us on our marriage. She was always very uh, practical, much more so than I ever was. If we pawned it, it would raise enough to cover things until Galantz paid up. I agreed that Spain mattered a lot more than a load of old knives and forks. I said we could tell his parents we'd sent them away to be engraved with the family crest. And Eric asked, do we have a family crest? So off he went to Paris to get his visa... And while he was there, he called in on Henry Miller. Um, I was living in Paris at that time, and Blair was passing through. He'd reviewed Tropic of Cancer and been highly complimentary, and we struck up a correspondence. I don't know if we were friends, but I liked him. I really did. I had an argument with the taxi driver on the way here. I'd made a mistake. The journey was only a couple of hundred yards and there was no profit for him and he was angry. He shouted at me and... I shouted back. Do you think you're too old for me to smash your face in? I actually... I, I bellowed at him. I surprised myself somewhat. <laughs> That's Paris, Blair. Hmm? She does that to you and you know what? Paris doesn't give a damn because she's what she's always been. The bitch you love and the love you hate. And she has you by the balls. And she knows it, too. <laughs> oh, damn, I almost forgot the kettle. I almost let it boil. I'm the enemy of good coffee. I used to live on coffee when I was in Paris. Ah, coffee and love. Um, coffee and no love, actually. Now, love is free. Uh, nothing in this world is free. In this world's the only world there is. There go. Uh, that makes you one hell of a miserable bastard, Blair. Maybe, yes. And now you're going to Spain. I was in Burma, you know. I was a policeman. I saw... I did discreditable things in the name of an empire I no longer believe in. Yeah, and now you never stop beating yourself up about it. There is such a thing as guilt, as being responsible, and you can't shrug that off. At least I can't. Payback. <laughs> Fascism isn't going away. Italy and Germany are both deeply involved in Spain. They see it as a rehearsal for the next war, the big one, 
That's the way human beings are. And I don't see that changing any time soon. Fascists, communists, <laughs> is there a difference? Here, thank you. It's hot. Be careful. Don't want to burn yourself before General Franco gets his chance. But nothing's going to change if we don't try to do something to change it. Well, I still think you're dumb to go to Spain. I couldn't look myself in the mirror if I didn't. Oh, it's good. It's good. It's good, Miller. You make a decent cup of coffee. Hmm. Now, there's a thing to have done in this world. Eh? But all your shooting and politics, is that going to change anything in the long run? In the long run, we're all dead. It's today and tomorrow that matter. Do we need another revolution? <laughs> what would you fight for? Ah, now, there you have it. Hmm? What I love. And what do you love, Miller? Mm. Damn, this is good. Cycling. Cycling? Mm. I cycled everywhere as a kid. Miles and miles and miles. I had three bikes. Mm -hmm. The best I bought from a German at Madison Square Gardens. Made in Bohemia. <laughs> Took everything I had. But she was a beauty. Ah, I used to talk to her as we flew along. <laughs> It was a perfect moment and a perfect time. If you could only put your Spaniards on a bike, then you might change history. Mm. You're not really a cyclist, are you, Blair? It sounds exhilarating, Miller, but no. I've ridden a horse, but... Uh... You're still going to get your ass blown off in Spain? I've been looking for a cause I could honestly shoot a rifle in support of all my life. And I, I think this is it. I ain't gonna say don't go. Every man has a right to go to hell or Spain <laughs> in his own way. By train for you, I guess. Yes, I leave tonight. Well, I don't have any advice, but I do have a damn fine jacket. Corduroy. Double lined, thick and warm. Here, take it. You'll need it if it gets cold down there. And it will get cold down there. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure when I'll be able to return it. Mm, you don't need to. Just stay warm, and if you can, stay safe. Only I have this feeling you won't do that. No, sir, you won't. <laughs> now, don't let this fine coffee go to waste. On the train going south through France, as we passed the little stations, there were French workers waving giving the anti-fascist salute. I felt... I felt that for the first time here was a movement, something bigger than borders, bigger than any country, something as big as the human heart, an urge to freedom and uh, decency. I, I travelled with a shoe salesman. I... <laughs> I tried to get a pair of good-sized twelve boots from him, but he only had he only had samples. He did tell me not to wear a suit once I arrived. It was the uniform of the oppressor. So I put on Henry Miller's jacket and... Eric Blair? Hmm? Yes, John McNair from the ILP office. Ah, they told me you were coming. Told me to look out for you. Well, you're not hard to find in a crowd of Spaniards. Welcome to Barcelona. Welcome to free Spain. Well, thank you, uh, comrade. It's good to be here. Sewers and oranges. It's the smell of freedom. Do you have luggage? Only what I'm carrying. Ah, you know that much then. Yeah, I learned it in Burma. Travel light, never carry anything you aren't prepared to lose, including your illusions. Actually, John Watson says it in a Sherlock Holmes story. Ah. What do you want to do first? A uh, cup of tea? You've come to Spain, not Stepney. We'll get a coffee. Barcelona struck me more forcibly than, than I think any other city I'd ever visited. Simply, it was the first time I'd ever been in a town where the working class were in the saddle. <laughs> Almost every building had huge red or black anarchist flags draped over it. 
Every wall had revolutionary symbols painted over it and over each other, and every shop and cafe told you it had been collectivised, and no one said sir, and everyone said comrade. It was exhilarating. Well, I wasn't exactly impressed with Eric Blair. I was told that someone would be arriving from the ILP in London and I should meet him, show him around. I didn't like his manner. I didn't like his accent. I didn't like the idea that he should get special treatment. I mean, who's this ex-public schoolboy lording it around Barcelona? It, and it didn't help that he was so tall and looked down on everyone. Take a seat. Thank you. No need to shove your bag under the table. It won't get stolen here. Uh, camarada! Cuando puedas? Salud, camarada. ¿Qué uh, tal? Uh, good. ¿Quién es el pie grandes? English. Come to write about the struggle. English too, huh? Eh? Me? I speak good English. Happy to make your acquaintance, comrade. Uh, uh, and you, comrade. You have come to see the free city of Barcelona. Here is the true revolution of the proletariat. I want to write about the war as well. No, no, you do not understand, comrade. We here in Catalonia do not make war. We make revolution. We fight for land. We fight for the control of the... Um, medios de producción. The means of production. Uh, for us, war is revolution. This you must understand, or you understand nothing. It's true, Magner. Is true, comrade. For a man to fight for no reason makes him an animal. But to fight for the people, for the land, for workers, this is a grand thing. Now, I'll bring you good coffee. Coffee of free men. Uh, he's a very interesting waiter. There are no waiters, only comrades. Goodness, no waiters. How does anyone get their coffee? Look, Blair, this isn't an adventure. This is serious. I understand that perfectly well. Do you? I think you might find the issues are rather more complex here than they seemed back in England. The issues are simple enough, surely. A fascist rebellion against an elected government must be defeated. It is time for men and women to stand up for freedom and, if necessary, lay down their lives for it, too. I'm sorry, my, my, my wife tells me that when I get on my high horse, I tend to sound like I'm addressing a political meeting. Mm -hmm. You need to understand one thing above all about Spain. This is the country where they invented surrealism and nothing is quite the way you think it is. Camaradas, ah. aquí os traigo el buen café de Barcelona. Ah, gracias. gracias. Os he traído también algo de pan. Yeah. Al pies grandes le vendrá bien comer un poco. Está chupalillo. What's that? What did he say? Pies grandes. Uh, he said you were too thin and have big feet. Ah, size 12s. I need to find some boots. Mm. Mm. Oh, it's good coffee. Yeah. Mm. The last good coffee I had was made by a man who thought all political activity was pointless. Listen, Blair. Mm. The Spanish left grew out of this country of Catalonia. Mm. Here is where 90% of Spain's industry is built, and it was out of those factories and workshops that the anarchists led the struggle for workers' freedom and land for the landless peasants. They were the first to throw themselves against the fascists, the first to die. Organised anarchy, it sounds... Surreal? <laughs> Only in Spain, and it isn't that organised. Yeah, but the Spanish left is bigger than just the anarchists. Yes, it's a loose gaggle of left, socialist and communist parties which have formed themselves into one grouping, PUM, the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification. It's PUM who are linked to the Independent Labour Party in England, and that is why I'm here instead of with the international brigades in Madrid. That, and the fact that Harry Pollitt didn't trust you, I trust you even less now. I'm part of the fight, aren't I? The Communist Party of Great Britain follows the general line of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And if there's anything the Russians hate more than a fascist, it's a Trotskyist. And Poom and the anarchists are, as the comrade waiter pointed out, the nearest thing to Trotsky this side of his Paris flat. Well, that doesn't really bother me, McNair. What I care about is being part of the struggle. But you are not. 
part of the struggle. You were part of the press, writing articles for the ILP magazine. I still need a good pair of boots if I'm going to the front line. They don't like journalists at the front. They get in the way. I wasn't thinking of writing. What I had in mind was more in the way of killing fascists. Did you, by God? Ever fired a gun? I fired a lot of them. Officer training in the corps at Eton? The bullet doesn't discriminate. Ever kill a man? Uh, no, but I've seen a man die by violence. Are you ready for this? I've been getting ready my whole life long. Then you'd better get used to these. Hmm? Spanish fags. Oh. That's what they issue the volunteers. Good. Oh. Good black Spanish tobacco. Oh, thank you. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> It's, no, it's, it's good stuff, if, uh, if somewhat strong. Then welcome to Barcelona and the revolution, comrade. I suppose he grew on me. There was also a letter from Fenner Brockway waiting at the ILP office, which explained that Mr Blair was actually George Orwell, the writer, not just a journalist looking for a war story. I, I thought he was well-meaning, but naive. But then, to an extent, most of us were. M McNair took me to the Lenin barracks, where I saw the young militiaman I talked about earlier. I signed on and joined the other recruits who were undergoing training of a sort... of a sort that I had never, never experienced before. The whole place was in a state of... in the condition of anarchy. We had uniforms of a sort, though what sort I can't to this day really say. Blue trousers, mine were, and too short. <laughs> My one pair of size 12 boots, a shirt I'd brought from England, Henry Miller's jacket. We were given instruction in uh, nothing very much. I remember an officer being furious because somebody asked for an order. There are no orders amongst comrades, comrade. And if a request was made and a comrade didn't agree, he said so, and a long political discussion would follow while the rest of us wandered off to play football. As for weapons that worked, uh, that were less than 50 years old or that were not corroded or rusted, no sign. Uh, there were rumours that the international brigades equipped by Russia had all the latest equipment. I couldn't say at that time. But what I remember is the spirit of those boys. And boys they mostly were. That was something to see. Young men and women realising for the first time that things could be changed for the better. For them. By them. Spain. A nation in turmoil. Brother against brother. Father against son. In the grip of civil war. In Barcelona, the young recruits of the Lenin Brigade march out for the front, where they will defend the Republic against her enemies. In Madrid, the international brigades resist the siege imposed by nationalist leader General Franco. In London, Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax speaks. The International Non-Intervention Committee has determined to the best of its ability that no foreign powers are now or intending in the future any interference in the Spanish war. Lord Halifax is flying to Germany to discuss the international situation with Herr Hitler and Signor Mussolini. In the skies of Spain, the crack pilots of Germany's Condor Legion fly their missions of support and supply. Hello? Hello, I, I was asked to report here to the, to the Commissar. Ah, I am the man, comrade. Uh, and you are the famous writer Eric Blair. Uh, George Orwell, actually, comrade. That, that's the name I use and, and not famous. Comrade, welcome. I am George Kopp. Uh, you have come from Barcelona? Oh, of course you have, with the volunteers. Yes, comrade. The training is good, huh? Good. Anarchist training? Yes, yes, it was, um, no, it was 
Very, uh, very interesting. There were a uh, lot of political discussions, some proposals, <laughs> uh, a few games of football. Actually, we, we played a lot of football, ah. anarchically. Uh, but not a lot of training. No. Uh, but a lot of revolutionary spirit, yes? Oh, yes. Good. The training we can supply. I was in the Belgian army. It was my speciality. Come, come, I will, uh, I'll show you the front line. The popular front line. <laughs> Has there been much fighting up here? So far, not so much, but it will come. Hopefully better equipment will come before then. Uh, the stuff we've been issued with is hopeless. Spirit, heart, revolutionary zeal is what we have, Comrade Blair. What the French call élan. What we Belgians call stupidity. <laughs> yes, I, I am Belgian. In the army during the war, decorated in a fight to preserve a corrupt system, but I have seen a better way. Here, we remake the world together. Are you all right, comrade? You know, I, I'm, I'm fine. I, I, I promised myself I wouldn't duck at my first bullet. Duck? Uh, his hide. Flinch, flinch. Ah, everybody ducks. It can't be helped. It is uh, a human nature. Uh, but we socialists, huh? We will change that. Well, and most of the comrades here don't seem to take cover at all. Ah, the young comrades defy the bullets of the fascists. They laugh in the face of danger. And they get shot. Which is a waste of material, as no doubt Vladimir Ilyich would have said. Don't be a fool for bravery, comrade. Our job is to win the war, not to die trying. And, of course, you might just as easily duck into a bullet as away from one. Really? Does that happen a lot? Comrade, always shot bursts. Why waste valuable bullets on fascist bastards when one or two will do the job? <laughs> Comrade Blair, I know you understand something of training men. I need that. Hmm? You must help. I will promote you to corporal, kebo, as soon as I'm able. And you will teach them what you know. British Army, yes? It, it, it's sometimes hard, I think, to get anarchists to listen. Uh, what do they say? Um, the first order is that there shall be no more orders. But we communists teach by example. Yes. What do they want to do? Kill fascists. Let us kill fascists together. You and I, Comrade Eric. Uh, and now I must leave you, but we will meet again. I know this. Can you see the future, comrade? Didn't you know? We communists make the future. Huh? <laughs> Be careful. What do you mean? What you say. Who you say it to. Out here in Catalonia, we are a long way from Barcelona. Even further from Moscow. But things get heard. And remembered. Not everything is as it appears. Hmm. And Salamos, camarada! <laughs> Marta los fascistas! Kill fascists! I wanted to do something for the cause. And I wanted to be near Eric. I went to Spain. As simple as that. Though, of course, it, it wasn't that simple. I left my aunt in charge of the shop. I took with me some of the things Eric had written that he missed. Taifu tea chocolates. His favourite tobacco. Apparently the, the black Spanish stuff was bad for his throat. I had a letter from Fenner Brockway stating that I was to work in the Independent Labour Party office in Barcelona in a secretarial capacity. That meant getting letters and supplies to the ILP men at the front and making sure their letters were sent on home with the least possible delay. I was to report to John McNair. Uh, I opened the door and there was this girl. Short, round-faced, rather uh, fresh-looking, actually rather pleasant and, <laughs> and obviously not Spanish. I said, can I help you, miss? And she said, no, uh, I've come to help you. <laughs> she had this, this huge case. Goodness knows how she'd managed it. I think it was bigger than she was. She announced, <clears throat> I am Eileen Blair, and proceeded to do exactly what she said she would, organise the whole kit and caboodle. She, she was good, too. And, uh, well, I have to say, 
I thought better of Blair just because she obviously loved him and thought the world of him. She was a breath of fresh air. But she didn't know, neither of them did, the threat that was ready to cut them off, cut them down. I think she had an inkling of the issues. Yes, she was, she was shrewd. She could see things. After working in the ILP office for a while, I, I got the idea I'd like to go to the front to see Eric, just to see what it was like. I, I don't intend that to sound like war tourism. It, it wasn't, but I missed him. I wanted to be with him, if only for a night. John McNair told me to see Eric's commanding officer, George Cobb. Not that there were any officers as such in a revolutionary army. <laughs> she was a, a very lively young woman. I took to her at once. I took her to dinner. You could still get a, a good dinner in Barcelona at that time. She wanted to go to the front. Well... <laughs> Who am I to refuse the wishes of a, a lovely woman? That winter in Zaragoza was unmitigated misery. I, um, I can remember cold, intense cold, hunger, everything getting wet and never drying, the smell of, uh, of, of wet cloth and, and, and the, uh, the boredom and no action. We sat there, cold and, and, and waiting, and waiting for something to happen. By March, it was snowing. We were all getting intensely frustrated. But then, one day, yes, I did finally get an enemy in the sights of my gun. Easy, easy. Don't, don't scare him. I've got him. I've got him. Steady, got come him. right, take your time. Steady. I'm shivering too much. I can't sight the bloody rifle. Wait a minute. Hurry. All right, all right, all right. Wait, wait. Pray to marks. This one's not a. a, a wait, wait, wait. He's moving. Eyes all right. Who's there? Go on, comrade. Take the shot. Got him. I hate the little buggers. One of them was eating my boots the other day, and I have no spare boots. Only they're not—they're uh, not little buggers, are they? These—these these buggers, they're big as cats. Rats as rats as big as big cats. <laughs> Bloody hell! Your shot did that. Run! What'd you do that for? Bloody idiot, I was eating my bloody breakfast. Save your bullets for the fascist, not the rats. We cannot eat rats. Come here. Bloody idiots. Come on, comrade, nobody likes rats except rats. <laughs> nobody likes Tories except Tories. We don't go around shooting them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <clears throat> here comes the brass. There's no brass now, comrade. Yeah, try to tell them that in Barcelona. Oh, more bloody. Holy mother of Marx, it's a woman. Pinch me, comrade. I've forgotten what they look like. Hello, Eric. Hello. Comrade Cop offered to give me a lift from Barcelona. Comrades, greetings. We have supplies and letters from home. Yay! 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 Bloody socialist tough even gets the girl. <laughs> Hello, comrade. It's a privilege to meet you. Oh, you too, comrade. It's a tonic, so it is. <laughs> comrade Blair, who ever thought that rangy bugger had such a lovely lady? <laughs> Comrade, girl. There are letters for everyone in the car. I made sure we got everything that was in the office. And there's tea and English cigarettes. Oh, bless you for that, comrade. No word for your comrade wife, Eric. God, it's good to see you. God, you need a bath. <laughs> Is it always this cold? No, uh, no, it's usually worse. Never mind. I needed to see you, my love, and here you are. Is it really as boring as your letters make it out? 
I shot a rat. Oh. Yes, it's, it's the most warlike thing I've done since I got here. Comrade Cobb says there's going to be a movement across the whole Zaragoza front once the weather improves. I hope so. Right now the war's a pantomime and we're the clowns. But you can't say there won't be any risk. Uh, no, no, I can't say that. I went to the hospital, the, the first aid station, whatever they call it, on the way. Oh, yes, I know. I, I, I saw the doctor there. He told me I was lacking food, lacking sleep. Did you see his hands? Hmm? Oh, did, did you see the place itself? Don't get wounded, Eric, and if you do, don't get sent to his hospital. Well, I shouldn't think it'll be up to me if it happens. And don't worry, I'll, I'll keep my head down. I do worry. Your head has so much further to go down than anyone else's. True. And really, darling, I, I don't think any of this is terribly well organised. As soon as I get leave, I'll come to Barcelona and transfer to the International Brigades. They know what they're doing. My comrade Cobb doesn't seem to trust them. Well, I like Cobb, but somehow I'm not sure I quite trust him. He's very charming. Well, there you are. I can take care of myself. Don't worry. Yes, but that's wrong, isn't it? I mean, we do worry, and we should worry about each other. Yes. Yes, we should. Comrade Blair, I've been reading your book. It's a good book. It reminded me of my own days in the coal fields of Belgium. But never mind that. I know you would value some time with your charming comrade wife, so please, you have my permission to leave the line. Uh, there is a, a farmhouse a few miles back, comrade Eileen. I would collect you there at three o'clock tomorrow morning. But, but I thought you had to return tonight. In war, nothing is certain. And for love, there is always time. Comrade Blair, I think I can promise you action soon. Ben Seremos. He didn't have to do that. My opinion of Comrade Cop has just improved somewhat. You see, Eric, <laughs> they want to keep you. What? I was talking to McNair and he, he let it out by mistake, well, I think... Maybe he intended me to know. But they don't want you to join the International Brigades. You're a name for them. George Orwell is fighting in Spain under the Independent Labour Party banner. McNair said the only reason all of you ILP volunteers are posted to the same unit is to make it look better for Fenner Brockway and the party. I think there's a lot more going on here than... And they want us to know. But surely we've got away from all that. It's still politics, even if it's war. Yes, but for tonight, it's you and me. And there had better be a bath at that farmhouse. <laughs> if not, mister, it's the horse trough for you. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed being at the front. Bob Edwards, who was the commander of the ILP contingent, was away, so Eric was actually in charge. But there was nothing to do except sentry duty on freezing night. Being the cabo didn't get me off that. After all, we were comrades. <coughs> Who goes there? Your relief. Uh. <coughs> At this time of night, it'd have to be that. Or a fool. <laughs> Afe. On frio, de cojones. What? What's brass monkey in Spanish? <laughs> Man, they say the fascists don't even like night attacks. <laughs> They're fascists. They obey orders. It's your fact. Thank you. <coughs> I bet V.R. Lenin never had a stand guard at two in the morning freezing his ass. Shall we wake them up over there? If we're missing our sleep, why shouldn't they miss theirs? All this. Don't waste ammo. Aren't we supposed to be anarchists? I don't know what we're supposed to be. Popular front, United front, Comintern, Trotskyist, Poom, Seventh International, anarcho-syndicalist. <laughs> don't ask me, comrade. We could sing. <coughs> All oh, right. <laughs> yeah, we could sing the Eaton boating song. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually um, I like it. Uh, I don't really know the words. You sing it. Jolly boating weather, 
and a hay harvest breeze blade on the feather <coughs> shade of the trees swing swing together with your bodies between your knees and nothing shall sever the chain that is round what the devil is that captain that sergeant is the english communists they're all mad quite mad the english it is a well known fact In Homage to Catalonia, Eric Blair was played by Joseph Milson, Eileen Blair by Lindsay Marshall, Georges Kopp by Ewan Bailey, John McNair by John McAndrew, Henry Miller by Richard Lang, Tom Gallagher by Gareth Pierce, The Spanish Volunteer by Javier Mazin, Jack by Howell John, Benjamin by John Lollis, Idris by Ben McGregor and The Militiaman by A.C. Newman. Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell was adapted by Mike Walker. It was a BBC Cymru Wales production, directed by Kate McCall. Episode 2 of Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell. Adapted for radio by Mike Walker. With Joseph Milson as Eric Blair. Catalonia. The trenches. The philosopher Thomas Hobbes once said, Force and fraud are in war, the two cardinal virtues. I think I was beginning to understand what he meant as we waited out the endless days of winter and the world changed around us into something infinitely more dangerous than the fascist rifles and field guns we faced across no man's land. So what are you going to do when you go home, comrade? Sleep, comrade. And eat. On oh, the wife. I'm going to do the wife. What about you, Comrade Blair? Um, I'm going to write a book. Of course he is. Me, I'm going to sleep. Eat. Salud, camaradas. Yeah, Comrade. Salud. We're talking about what we'll do when all this is over. Cuando la guerra termine. La guerra no terminará hasta que la burguesía deje de existir y explotar al proletariado. What's he saying, Comrade? The war never ends. Mm. He's got that right. The war never ends. Only the enemy changes. We were moved from the Zaragoza front to Huesca. Uh, the town was under fascist control. Uh, our posting was no more than a thousand yards from their lines. We could smell the coffee that they were drinking and we were not. We used to say, we'll have coffee in Huesca tomorrow. Café en Huesca mañana. It was April 1937. Uh, I'd been in the front lines for five months and still hadn't seen any action beyond the odd angry shot and a few dead rats. They've sent up more grenades. Maybe something's going to happen at last. Chance would be a fine thing. Cigarette, comrade? Aye, uh, go on then. Oh. <coughs> I'm trying to give them up. Killing me, they are. Mm. More chance of that than being wounded in action. Mm. That's what they say. War is 99% boredom, 1% sheer terror. <laughs> yeah, mm. well, some of us didn't come here to scratch our balls and sit around scribbling notes for magazines back in England. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think that matters, telling people what's happening? If Franco's not going to go away because of anything you might say, comrade writer. Mm. If he goes, it'll be because the proletariat get their hands round his throat and wring his bloody neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maradas, hmm? necesito 15 voluntarios para esta noche. 
I want 15 volunteers for an attack tonight. Uh, what's up, comrade? Big attack along the Huesca front. <laughs> Will it happen this time, comrade? Engrasad los cartuchos. Quitadle lustra a las bayonetas. Nos vamos a medianoche. Presentaos a las 10 de la noche. Venceremos. Looks like this is it at last. <laughs> Any instructions, comrade writer? Yes, uh, get some rest, get some food. Write any last letters. <laughs> Cheerful bugger, ain't you, Eric? Hmm? Before you said the fascists couldn't hit a bull in a passage. Night attack over unknown ground. <laughs> Jack, it's no piece of cake. If I were you, I'd write those letters. What time did he say? Ten o'clock. He said ten o'clock. <sighs> right, don't worry. <clears throat> the itching will keep us awake. The days were getting warmer. The cold was no longer our enemy. Now it was lice. Damned lice. Mm. Well, they were in every seam of your clothes, uh, in, your, in your bedding, in your body hair, everywhere. Vile little blood-sucking parasites, driving you mad with... We hated them even more than we hated the fascists, I think. I wanted to see some action before the lice finished me off. And I did. The thing about action... The thing about it... Nobody knows what's happening. Not the people who plan it or command it. Least of all, the people who actually do the fighting. It was raining as we gathered at the staging point to listen to our commander... Comrade Cop. Comrades! Our forces are advancing tonight to attack the fascist garrison defending Huesca. To ensure that you do not fire upon friends, every man will wear a white band on his left arm. White band, left arm. Camarada Comandante, los braceletes blancos no hay No hay braceletes blancos. There, there are no white bands, comrades. <laughs> Why not get the fascists to wear white bands? <laughs> <laughs> Keep your wits about you at all times. No hay brazaletes blancos. Está dos abridor en todo momento. It's up to us to show the comrades elsewhere what we of the Lenin Brigade can do. Death to the fascists! Yes. 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 Long live the working yes. class! Yes. Yes. Le dicen que el café y brandy están listos en una hora. What's that he says? It's coffee and brandy, he says. Commissar can't be wrong. Let, let's find it. So before the rest of these buggers are uh, comrades, <laughs> will it down? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Was there coffee? No coffee. No brandy. Uh, tomorrow there'll be both. Tomorrow. Coffee in Wesker. Huh. Filthy night. <laughs> they won't be expecting us. Their discipline will break down. They won't be watching. Uh, these are regular soldiers. From what I heard, they shoot sentries who leave their posts. Aha, uh -huh, but they are also Spaniards, and most of them are conscripts. They have no political consciousness. They have no reason, no cause, no great idea driving them on. But every man in this brigade is prepared to die for land and liberty, for the victory of the proletariat and the landless peasants, if not for Stalin and the United Front. <laughs> United Front, Popular Front. Um, the war needs to be won before we start arguing about theory, comrade. I hope he agrees with you. Why shouldn't he? Because Comrade Stalin, like God, is unknowable. And as to what he wants, here, I have brandy. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. You know, Stalin was at a seminary. He thinks, that man, he thinks like a, a theologian. I know Russians, trust me. How? Maybe I am Russian. Thought you were Belgian. Who are any of us when it comes down to it, Comrade Orwell? Hmm? Take care tonight. I like your wife. I wouldn't want her to be a widow. Halto! <coughs> 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 
garage. Comrades, we are going up that hill. Keep your positions and keep quiet. We must get close enough to throw our grenades before the fascists start firing. Necesitamos acercarnos para lanzar nuestras granadas antes que de los fascistas empiecen a disparar. No levantéis la cabeza. Keep your heads down. Especialmente el camarada alto. <laughs> that means you, comrade Eric. I will cut the wire. Let every man get through before any man throws his bomb. Understood? Yeah. And in the enemy trench, when we take it, bayonets only. Solo la bayoneta en la trinchera. I was at the front as we scrambled up the hill. Rain was in our faces. I just wanted to get there, to the fascist trenches. Just get there, to be done with this crawling through the mud. Why? Shh, shh. Mind your hands. Hold it. Go through. Go through. Nobody throw until I throw. Adentro. Pasa. Que nadie tira hasta que yo lo haga. Adentro. We got through the wire and we waited. And Blair kept putting his head up. You could see that head of his sticking up against the sky. And then Comrade Benjamin shouted something, throw or something. And we threw. I don't think we charged. We lumbered into that trench. We were in and, and I heard, I remember hearing Blair, Comrade Blair, shouting. Come on, out of there, you! As, as, if, he was, as if he was a schoolmaster who'd caught some oik smoking behind the bike sheds. Except I don't suppose they had bike sheds at his school. <laughs> it was a fascist. A real fascist. And I shouted at him and he ran. He, he ran. I ran after him, trying to poke him with my bayonet. I remembered there and then our boxing instructor at school telling us how he'd bayoneted a Turk, and that's what I did. I lunged and shouted, and he jumped away, and I lunged, and he jumped, and I lunged, and he jumped, and then he was gone. We could hold this place. Given the ammo and the machine gun, but we could stay right where we are. Oh God, what I wouldn't give for a half decent mortar, for, for any bloody thing that works. Comrade Benjamin, Comrade Benjamin, what, what do we do? What are your orders? Do we hold? We pull back! What do you mean? Pull back! Everyone, back to our lines! That's crazy! We can hold this position! Pick up anything useful! <laughs> Well, why do we bloody come here in the first place? So we slithered down that hill, and we were dragging these huge, heavy boxes of ammo through mud. The fascists were throwing bombs from the retaken trenches. They were rolling down the hill, and they weren't duds. I yelled, run, and stood up, and... <laughs> you know... You know, you're sodden weighed down with mud and your rifle and an ammunition box, but you can run. You can always run when you think you're going to get shot any second. And when we got back, we found Comrade Jack was missing. Well, someone said he was hit. Comrade Blair, he went back up alone, up that hill, in mud and rain, to look for him. He said it was safer alone. I respected that. It made me think about him in a different way. We were given leave. I took a train for Barcelona. Arriving there, I remember, at the station at three o'clock on the afternoon of 26th of April. Eric! <laughs> Eric! <laughs> oh, my... Oh, oh. 
Just fuck it. God, you are safe. I was so worried. Cops said you, you were all right, but I couldn't... I couldn't... I couldn't... <laughs> I had arrived in Barcelona the previous year, shortly after Eric had been posted to the Zaragoza front. It was only a few months after our wedding. The atmosphere in the city then was exhilarating. By spring, everything had changed. I'd booked into the Continental Hotel with Eileen and had a bath, long, long bath, and then we went out. It's different. It's been like this for a month or more. Mm -hmm. No flags, no marches, no slogans. Cop says something's going to happen soon, but he doesn't know what. I suspect Cop knows more than he tells you. I think he's honest. Mm. I trust him. Well, so far. So far? He knows people. He can get things. Food, drink, restaurant tables. Oh. He, um... He takes you to dinner? Once or twice. Oh. He's a charming man, Eric. Mm, too charming. You wouldn't know charm if it was an elephant. I once shot an elephant. I know. Let's get coffee, shall we? Hmm, why not? I know a cafe. McNair took me when I first arrived. Señor, señora, ¿qué desea tomar? Comrade waiter, do you remember me? In the winter, I, I came here with Comrade McNair. Oh, yes. Pies grandes. Bigfoot. <laughs> Comrade, what's happened? Our coffee's still the best. But for the rest, it was another time, I think. Yeah, well, a time of hope. I remember it. No more waiters, only free men and women sharing the results of their labor. And now, que sorpresa. There are waiters again. It is like magic trick, eh? Oye, camarero. I must go. I'll bring you coffee. It's lost something. Lost what? The revolution. Not the war, but the revolution has gone out of the place. McNair thinks Russian money is changing things. Who pays the piper? He's worried about keeping the office going, about the Wesker front. Cop says you've had enough of the anarchists and you want to leave Poom. Cop again. He says you talk to him about it joining the International Brigade in Madrid once you were on leave. Well, it's not his business. Well, it is. He's your commanding officer and... Isn't he a friend? He's your friend, obviously. Don't be silly, Eric. He cares about both of us. Is it true? Do you want to leave? I want to be part of something that works because it's well-trained, well-supplied and well-led. And you think the International Brigade is all of these things? As far as I'm concerned, Eileen, the politicking can go to the devil. This war won't be won with good intentions. If six, <laughs> if six months in the trenches have taught me nothing else, it's taught me that. Uh, sorry, public meeting again. <laughs> Before you fall in love with the Communist Party... Mm. You'd better listen to this. What is it? Hmm? Harry Pollitt's review of Wigan Pier in The Daily Worker. Oh. Here is George Orwell, a disillusioned little middle-class boy who has decided to see what socialism has to offer an ex-imperial policeman. His chief complaint is that the working classes smell... If Orwell could only hear what socialists and the left will say about this book, then he might make a resolution never to write again about a subject which he does not understand. Oh, well. I didn't send it. I didn't think you'd want to read it at the front. Well, might have found a good use for it. We were short of lavatory. Eric. I'll bring you the good coffee of Barcelona. Thank you. Comrade. Mm. There are many in the city who are not true comrades. They listen, they make report. Cuidado, be careful who you speak to.
McNair? McNair? Comrade Blair, what can I do for you? Coffee? No, I don't want coffee, thank you. Listen, I want to leave the Lenin Brigade. I'm not alone in this. I know a number of the ILP men are with me. We're not against Poom, but we can be of more use to the struggle in Madrid. I know there have been problems. Problems? Half, at least half of our rifles are not fit for purpose. The ammunition, the, 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 the bombs, if they work, it's a miracle. The, the uniforms, the training, anything that makes for an efficient army is, is, is simply not there. Except the heart. The heart is an organ like any other and susceptible to bullets. You've changed since last we met. I try to learn from experience and ask the questions that need to be asked. Well, let me tell you, comrade. Hmm? The commissar in Madrid, André Marti, will not welcome questions or disagreement or any opinion other than his own, which is the Communist Party line straight out of Moscow. And Marti does not argue. He has you shot. I know he's had at least 100 men shot in Madrid. And please don't tell me he gets things done. I wasn't about to, but nevertheless... Uh, Comrades! Did you hear? There's been some kind of uh, trouble at the telephone exchange. What? I'm going to see if there's anything to it. Comrade Eric, you're the writer. You'll want to see this? Of course. Just allow me one thing, Blair. Wait until May Day before you leave, all right? We should go. In the streets, we saw young men with the anarchist red and black handkerchief round their necks. They were edging along a, a side road that ran off the Ramblas, and uh, everyone was trying to get under cover or into the metro station. Get into cover, Eric! Uh, I, I think they're firing at the church. Yes, but at who? The authorities, I would say. But who are they? Not us. We should get to the Hotel Falcon. That's where the, the Poom HQ is set up. This doesn't look good. I'll see if I can find out what's happening. It's all right. Idris? Idris, what the hell is going on here? As far as I know, the communists arrived in force at the telephone exchange and told the anarchists to clear out. They were taken over. Only it didn't happen. Our lads told them to skedaddle. But this is crazy. Aren't we supposed to be fighting the same war? <laughs> you tell me, comrade. You tell me. Uh, comrades, there's no time to be lost. I need you out front. The militias are attacking. We need to hold this position. Here, take a rifle. <clears throat> I need comrades. Four, five, good shots. Hurry, hurry! It seems the left was by no means as united as any of us had thought. Stalin and the Russians had their own agenda from the start, and it had very little to do with Spain. They were beginning to arrest Poom, that's the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification, and anarchist members of the government, liquidating, as they called it, the enemies of the party. From the hotel we could see the street. The militia was composed mostly of police. I didn't know what this was all about at the time. Nobody did on our side. What I do know is that whenever I see working men fighting the police, I don't have to ask myself which side I'm on. They've got automatic weapons. I know this, comrade. How long can we hold them? Should we evacuate the building? Not yet. Ah, dud! Another dud! What the...? Grenades! And this work! Can you see where they are? In the calf. Look, in the shadows at the back, you can see them. If we had good rifles, we could clean them out. Well, maybe we can do it anyway, comrade. Cover me. Don't be an idiot, cop. You can't go out there. I don't think they want to be here. What? They're frightened. How can you possibly know that? I don't think they're shooting with conviction somehow. You're, you're mad. I told you. I'm Russian. We're all mad. You told me you were Belgian. They're mad too. Salute, camaradas! <laughs> don't shoot, don't, don't shoot! We need to talk. There's no need for everyone to die. We can work this out. It was a... How do you call it? Tricky moment. I laid my revolver down, walked over. 
I was right. They were mostly boys, and they were frightened. They didn't know what was happening. They didn't want to die. They would have killed us quite happily, but they couldn't do the one without the risk of the other. During the afternoon, things seemed to calm down a little. Eric got a message back to me saying he was safe, but that meant nothing. Everything was falling apart, and no one seemed to have any idea of what was actually happening. I wouldn't have.、Uh, I wouldn't have walked out onto that street facing frightened boys with automatics for twenty pounds. It was it was a damn brave thing to do. Street fighting in Barcelona is impossible for the foreigner. The the maze of the Ramblas, the loyalties of separate areas, the the endless opportunity to get up high and shoot down. It seemed like every faction in the city had its own hotel,、uh, department store, cinema, and there they sat, sometimes shooting, sometimes not. The streets below soon emptied of anyone who wasn't fighting. <laughs> These May days of fighting in the streets. I think no experience I've ever had. Including in Burma, has been so、uh, sickening, disillusioning, so disheartening. Because everything I saw was overlaid with the Barcelona of six months before, a socialist city, a workers' state, a sort of paradise, a sort of paradise lost. We established ourselves on the roof of the cinema, Holiorama. Tom, where did you get to? Stuck on the road, comrade.、Ah. <laughs> Only arrived this morning to find this bloody lot going on. Some leave, eh?、Ah, did you bring any ammo? Oh yeah. Here you go. That. <laughs> so we've got. I searched the hotel. Half a dozen rifles, a few hundred rounds. <sighs> Better hope no one wants a fight. Well, you didn't cheat up, did you, comrade? It's、oh, not all to be cheerful about. Oh, I did get word from Jack. He's mending. They're going to send him home. Yeah, best place too. Better than this rat hole. What happened to the victory of the proletariat, comrade? <sighs> you tell me. So, what's going on? Well, we're here on the cinema roof, yes, and、yes. they're over there on the department store roof. And so far, nobody is shooting anybody else. And since we're all still comrades, we've agreed that if either side get the order to start shooting, we let each other know, so no bugger gets caught short. It's very civilised. <laughs> My ass.、Mm? Yeah, it's a bloody joke, though.、Uh, we're doing the fascists' work for them. <laughs> well, I always thought I was a communist, but now it turns out I'm a Trotskyist traitor to the Comintern. There are some good men in the brigades. They've held Madrid. It's not the men, comrade. Not the soldiers. Not the ones who die. It's never them. <laughs> oh, hey, you over there? Hey, don't you shoot at us? No se estaba disparando. I, I wasn't shooting at you. I was shooting at him. Yeah. Down in the street. Just watch where you point that barrel. You have to point it at the target if you want to hit anything. Yeah. We're all workers here, okay? All of us.、Yeah. There's no need to shoot at each other. Yeah, right, comrade. The next cerveza. Have you got any beer? No. No. No beer. Have you got any beer? Tampoco. No beer. No that. No.、Oh. No beer here. So what now? We wait. See if any bugger can sort this out and let us get back to the war. I suppose it went on for a week or so. I remember I am.、Um, I had a pile of penguin books I'd picked up somewhere. I think I read through them all on that cinema roof. We thought things would settle down once this little power struggle had worked itself out. We simply didn't realise how serious the situation was, and that we and most of the ILP volunteers were surrounded by spies. By the fifth of May, there there was a change. Rumours and counter rumours were everywhere that Poom was to be banned. Its leader Andreas Nin had been arrested. Anarchists 
were coming from the Aragon Front to defend Barcelona and communist militias from Madrid to subdue it. It was as if a cold front had suddenly descended over the city and the sun had disappeared. Nobody knew what was happening. Mm, simply put, Stalin hated Trotsky and always had. Stalin believed in socialism in one country, Trotsky in permanent revolution in every country. They were uh, contenders for Lenin's crown. Trotsky lost in Stalin's credo that meant he deserved to die. It was no coincidence, I always think, that Trotsky's assassin, Ramon Gmekather, received his training as a common turn agent in Barcelona at this time. It was infuriating. I'd been months in the front line. Now I had my leave, I was sitting on a cinema roof, aiming my probably useless rifle at supposed allies. It's all such a waste of time. All of us sitting on that cinema roof, passing time reading paperback books. I finished this one. Uh, got another? Oh, uh, yes. Hold on. Um, uh, here. Yeah. Try this. Mm. Uh, <coughs> Zamyatin. W-E. I've never heard of this. We. Zamyatin. It's a Russian writer. It's a, it's a scientific romance, oh. like H.G. Uh, Wells. Uh, a society where thought and actions are controlled totally by the state and love. And... <laughs> Sounds familiar? Yes. Oh, yes. Hey, 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 wait, wait a minute. Hmm? What is Shh. it, comrade? Shh. Listen. Listen to what? It's stopped. That bloody noise has stopped. <laughs> Hold on. Maybe it's over. <laughs> For now. Hey, comrades! What have you heard? They say there's a truce! Militia came from Valencia. The fighting is to stop. We can get back to the fighting. <laughs> he says the fighting is to stop, so we can get back to the fighting. <laughs> Bloody double think if you ask me. <laughs> they were right. The fighting had stopped. Eric had about two days of leave left. He came back to the hotel and slept 24 hours straight. I didn't have the heart to wake him. But we did have dinner together on the last night at the hotel. Georges Kopp arranged it. Actually, the three of us had dinner. <coughs> the waiters are back in uniform and calling people sir and madam. Again. Yeah, and the soldiers at the front are still making do. But that's about to change. Uh, the government in Valencia is installing proper supplies, proper ranks, proper discipline. Yeah. Look at this place. All the, all the scum of the world floating to the surface, still making and spending money. You know, when I first got here, I, I met a journalist who said the war was a racket the same as any other. I didn't, didn't believe him then. Buenas tardes, dama, caballeros. ¿Os puedo ofrecer nuestra carta? Yeah, gracias, camarada. My pleasure, sir. So, what's it to be? Uh, sardines. I, I see you have sardines. Sardine, sir. Sardine? Sí, señor. They have a sardine. Each? Yes, one sardine each. Each. Is it, is it a large sardine? I fear it is not, sir. I, I think I'll have sardine, then. Eric? Mm? Uh, yes, uh, sardine too, I think. Uh, sardine for all, comrade, and, and wine for all. Si, senor. <coughs> so, things are not so good even for the bourgeoisie. Which means worse for the people. At least the fighting has stopped. They can get to the shops if there's anything to buy. Uh, they're used to it here. Someone once said they should number the cobblestones because they're torn up and used in riots so often. It's not good, is it, George? I don't know. Who can say? Things might settle down. 
Señora, caballero, caballero, sus sardinas. Another waiter told us that. One who still answered to comrade. What's happening? What, what's really happening? Hmm. We are eating a sardine. It is a good sardine. It is all you could hope for from a sardine. But it did not last long. You should go home to England. Eileen, Eric, both of you. I go. can't do that. It would be desertion. You know, I have been told there was an article in the Daily Worker on Barcelona. It said my name was mentioned. It was said I regularly talked with fascists at the front. That Poom and the anarchists are, how did they say it? Objectively fascist. Objectively fascist? Do, do those words mean anything at all? It means they can mean anything at all. In this case, that Poom and the anarchists form a fifth column promoting fascist aims and the defeat of the <coughs> Republic. I don't see a rosy future, comrades, for any of us. We really should go. And yet we won't, will we? Because we believe there's still something to fight for. <coughs> there any coffee? Creo que queda algo en el cazo, camarada. Uh, in the pot? Pot. Uh, pot. Uh, yes, si. Sí. Thanks, comrade. Uh, gracias. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Calentito, oh. a que si? Sí? bloody hot. It's good. I needed that. Cigarette? Comrade? Oh, gracias, camarada. Uh, thank you. Qué fuerte sienta por la mañana. Yeah. They say it's Russian tobacco. Uh, tobacco <coughs> ruso. <coughs> oh. Voy a matar a esos malditos gallos y desayunármelos. Kill the rooster. El galo. Los dos. Uno, bang, dos. Bang. Very good. I, I shot an elephant once. Ne never shot a rooster. Um, prefer to shoot at fascists. Uh, no puedo comer fachas. You choke on a fascist, but a good chicken, eh? Huh? Oh, 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 even a bad one. It is food, and a hungry man never turns away food. Can you see it? Justo en el punto de mira de mi... Oh, putas balas saboteadoras! Another dud. That, that's the trouble. Nothing works here. Hoy han ganado los gallos, pero mañana... Yeah. That's it, comrade. Today the chickens won. Tomorrow we'll kill back. It was the 20th of May, 1937. I was hit, shot, uh, shot in the throat by a fascist sniper. It was on the Huesca front. I was part of the 29th Division of the People's Army. I was a lieutenant. It was after the May days of fighting in Barcelona. The old Lenin Brigade had been reorganised. Everything had been reorganised except the people who actually did the fighting. He'd bitten his lips when he was hit. There was a pool of blood. I reckoned he was gone for sure. A throat wound? You don't come back from that. I was moved to a clearing station. Casualty clearing and then... Well, then I, I, I was in a lot of pain. Uh, a huge amount of pain... Enough to make me swear, but whenever I did, I started spouting blood again. I, I remember thinking, well, if it hurt so much, then maybe I wasn't going to die. Hey, comrade. They told us you were still hanging on. <coughs> oh, they said you'd lost your voice. 
And I'll make a change with old Comrade Blair having to shove a bung in it. <laughs> we brought you some tobacco, if they let you smoke. Uh, knowing you, they won't be able to stop you. <laughs> and uh, we want any equipment you've got that didn't get nicked yet. Torch, knife. Have you still got your revolver? What about your watch? We can use that. Benjamin sends his comradely greetings. <laughs> Says he misses you. <sighs> Still, you got your ticket home now, comrade. After a week or so with what was pretty basic medical attention, I was, uh, I was sent along with a load of other wounded to the big hospital at Lerida and then on to Barcelona. I was walking. I'd seen a doctor who told me I'd never get my voice back. Uh, all I wanted to do was was get out of the hospital. Uh, Eric was not a good patient, and uh, I agree, the hospitals were not what he was used to at home, but they were by no means worthless. I saw his doctor and got his notes. The bullet passed between the trachea and the carotid artery, missing both. Even so, given his general condition after months on the front line, he should never have recovered as quickly as he did. You might have said it was a miracle, if you believed in such things. By the time he got back to Barcelona in mid-June, he was walking and able to meet me at the hotel. But by then, everything had changed yet again. Yes, um, it was late when I got back to Barcelona. Uh, I'd received my discharge papers and was more or less on my own. It was a strange atmosphere. There were no taxis. I felt as if I was a tourist once again. But I had no purpose. I remember I, I found my way to the Hotel Continental where Eileen was staying. She was in the lounge. It was the first time we'd seen each other since I'd been wounded. Uh, but she was very calm. Uh, too calm. Eileen? Oh, Eileen. Hello, darling. Oh. How nice to see you. Oh. Get out. What? Get out of here at once. I, I don't... You, you, you have to get out and hide <coughs> before they call the police. But... We have to go outside. Get out now. Now. <laughs> what's, uh, what, what's going on? Just keep walking, Eric. <clears throat> you haven't heard? I haven't heard anything. I've, I've been in hospital. Who have been suppressed? They've raided all the officers, the ILP too. <coughs> people are being arrested. They say they're shooting people already. I, I need to sit down. I need, I need, I need time to the, think. The police have spies in all the big cafes. I, I, I know somewhere... I know somewhere we can go. Comrade Waiter. Ah, el pies grandes. <laughs> can you find us a table? Where no one will see you? I'll do that, but even so... Shh. And I will bring you the good coffee of Barcelona. There is no food, I fear. <laughs> really happened? Three days ago. <sighs> the police arrested Andreas Nin. They say he is being tortured. They raided the Hotel Falcon and arrested everyone there. They turned the whole place into a prison. Poom was declared illegal. Mm. Everything connected with it is forbidden to the, the anarchists and the CNT, everything. The whole party executive is in prison. It seems they are keeping the news from any poom or anarchist at the front so they don't stop fighting. It, it's bad. Eric, it, it's very bad. Here is your coffee, comrades. Oh, thank you. It is, I think, the last of its kind to be seen in Barcelona. After now, all the coffee will be from Moscow. Do they even drink it there? 
They drink where they are told. You must leave this country, comrades, as soon as you can. I'm here. No, no, no. There is nothing to pay. We have all paid too much. <laughs> it's good. <coughs> good, good coffee. Henry Miller would have appreciated it. Perhaps he would have appreciated all of it. I don't understand. But then we are neither of us cyclists. Eric. <laughs> it's, it's nothing. There is something else. Mm -hmm. They raided the hotel. <laughs> my room. What? At four o'clock in the morning. There were six of them. They walked in. They had a key. They walked in and... They took everything, Eric. Every scrap of paper, our letters or your notebooks, letters about Wigan Pier, everything. And I, I am so sorry. I know what it must mean. But, but, th but they left you alone. Thank God they did. It was horrible. It was like... I, I, don't, even, I don't even know what it was like. It, Suspicion, mm -hmm. fear, uncertainty, mm -hmm. hatred, not being able to trust anyone anymore. <laughs> As if everything you do is being watched by someone who wishes you no goodwill at all. It's hateful and, and it's there every day. All the time. I'm not a party member of Poom. I, uh, I don't even belong to the ILP. I can't see why they would want to arrest me. I think we should. I think we should go back to the hotel together and and, uh, and brazen it up. And if they come again at four in the morning, I was just a volunteer. And Harry Pollitt is just the general secretary <laughs> of the Communist Party of Great Britain, and hates your book <sighs> and thinks you are a danger to the United Front and Russia's fight against fascism. Don't be naive, Eric. You have a name now, like it or not, and they don't like it. And you would not be the first writer the communists have killed. Georges tells me they are arresting hundreds, thousands of intellectuals in Russia now, as we speak. You've seen Cobb? Of course I've seen him. He's our friend. Mm. Look, if you don't believe me, meet him tomorrow morning. He's here? Yes. And you and he? I'll tell him to be here tomorrow at 11. But for my sake, find somewhere, anywhere, stay out of sight. It was so impossible, unthinkable. The fact that I wasn't guilty of anything except a tendency, Trotskyism. I had to forget any English notion I was safe as long as I stayed within the law. These, um, these communist policemen, trained by the men from Moscow, stated quite simply that the, the law and the truth was what they said it was. And, um, <coughs> well, all of them were imbued with that, uh, that communist fallacy, as I later came to see it, that, that somehow it was weak and shameful to show compassion or understanding to enemies of the party. They all wanted to be the man of steel, impervious to mercy. We went through my pockets for anything that might be compromising, um, there was my militiaman's card with Poom on it, a photograph from the front line, Jack, Idris, Tom looking grumpy as usual. We were standing in front of a Poom flag. Everything was thrown away. Eric disappeared into the night, and I went back to the hotel. I called Georges Cop to let him know Eric was safe and wanted to meet. We agreed on the time. The relationship between a man and a woman, what they see in each other, what they need from each other, and what they can give to each other, this is an infinite mystery. There is no party line in love, no united front or popular front. These are things which are better not explored by science or politics.
Besides, there were other problems at that time. Eileen? Eileen? What is it? Right, here. Drink this. <coughs> now, tell me, what is it? Where's Cop? Arrested. This morning, outside the hotel. <laughs> A car. It stopped, and they got out. Yeah, they, and they, they, who? They, they. It's always the same thing. All right, Eileen, Eileen. <laughs> Eileen, shh, shh, shh. Be calm, be calm. I know it's not easy. We have to think. We have to help him, Eric. <laughs> All right, do you know where they were holding him? With everyone else, I suppose, at the Falcon. But there's so many of them. Uh, we can't stay here. I don't want to go back to the hotel. We're here in Spain, not anymore. We'll go to the British consulate. We'll, uh, we'll see if they can get us a ticket out. Somehow. We got to the consulate with little trouble. It seemed that nights were the worst times, when the streets were empty and they could move around with ease. The news wasn't good. A comrade, a good friend of Eric's, Idris, from Swansea, who had been at the front and on the roof with him, it seems he had been arrested and died in prison. Illness, they said. We were advised not to, uh, not to go and see a cop. Just being identified as a friend of the arrested could brand you as guilty too. <coughs> the last time I was in here, I was shooting out at the people who are in here now. It's mad as well as stupid, as if everything means the opposite of what it says. Ah. Uh, Excuse me. We we wish to see <coughs> prisoner cop. He's uh he's not being held. Uh, no esta incommunicado. I um I think we have the right to see him. Espera aquí. Voy a comprobarlo. We waited half an hour, or a bit a bit more. Then we were taken to the courtyard. Georges didn't really look any different as smart and cheerful as usual, as if nothing had happened. Comrades, you shouldn't be here. We had to come. How are they treating you, Georges? Oh, so far, so good. Tomorrow we should probably all be shot. <laughs> you know, Andreas Nin is dead. Oh. Tortured to death, they say. Who, who says? My cellmate. He was allied to the CNT. He seems to know a lot. Uh, um, I Idris, do you remember him? I do, my friend. Dead too, mm. they tell me. He was sick, they say. They say, my dear, but they lie. <laughs> I heard this morning before I was arrested, <coughs> he was kicked to death. <gasps> here, in the jail. They say he spat in their faces and refused to confess. Just conf confess to what? Whatever they wished. <sighs> All he did... All he did was come here to fight for something better. It's so utterly uh, pointless to die like that. Aren't we entering the age of pointlessness? <laughs> we have to get you out of here. Uh, it cannot be done. At least not by you, and not now. You must go today, tomorrow, but no later. Stay and you will be arrested. My cellmate, this man, O'Brien... Did you ever hear of him? I think he came to the office once or twice. I'm not sure. I do not trust him. He asks too many questions and knows too much. Right. <laughs> Even more than I do. Now go. I thank you for coming, my friend, <coughs> but you must save yourselves. Uh, and Eric, mm -hmm. tell them. Mm -hmm. Tell them what happened here in Barcelona in the days of May 1937 when good men and women were betrayed by those they believed to be their comrades. We had no idea what would happen to Georges Kopp. We feared the worst. We, we did not know. All we did know was that we had to get out of Barcelona. And that was part of the strangeness of it all. By night, Eric was sleeping in churchyards and skulking in back streets while the police 
search for Trotskyists. On my way through France, the shoe salesman had told me, take off your suit, you look like the bourgeoisie, they, they won't trust you in Barcelona. But now, now the bourgeoisie were trusted once again. Their wealth and indifference proclaimed their innocence. So we shone our shoes, we put on our best clothes, we hired a taxi and made the driver carry our suitcases. Remembering it, it seems insane. But they were insane times. Porter! Porter! Bless, uh, las uh, malatas. Por favor. My dear, shall we... Shall we find our compartment? Why not, darling? <laughs> Can you see anyone? There's <laughs> two by the barrier. I think they're railway police. We should be all right. The tickets? Yes, I have them. I have them. Now, just look arrogant. I'm not sure how. Copy me. I was taught by the best at Eton. Los billetes, caballero? Of course. Muchas gracias, señor. Coche cinco, compartimento siete. Thank you. Thank you. Siguiente. How long before we leave? Huh? This is Spain. Who knows? What can we do, Eric? Hmm? For George, for Jack and the others, for all the brave causes, what can we do? We can go on. That, uh, that means something. What's going on? If it, uh, if it means we can shout rudely and tell them what happened, even if it embarrasses them, then yes, I think so. Oh. Thank God. Oh, thank God. Good Lord. Did you hear that? The station clock just just struck 13. How very Spanish. <laughs> Must be broken. Perhaps a shot hit it. I'm sure they'll mend it soon. In Homage to Catalonia, Eric Blair was played by Joseph Milson. Eileen Blair by Lindsay Marshall. George Kopp by Ewan Bailey. John McNair by John McAndrew. Henry Miller by Richard Lang. Tom Gallagher by Gareth Pierce. The Spanish Volunteer by Javier Mazin. Jack by Howell John. Benjamin by John Lawless. Idris by Ben McGregor and The Militiaman by A.C. Newman. Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell was adapted by Mike Walker. It was a BBC Cymru Wales production, directed by Kate McCall. <laughs>